Faster than fairies, faster than witches, bridges and houses, hedges and ditches, and charging along like troops in a battle, all through the meadows, the horses and cattle, all of the sights of the hill and the plain, fly as thick as driving rain, and ever again in the wink of an eye, painted stations whistle by, and here is a mill, and there is a river, each a glimpse, and gone forever. The University City of Cambridge is situated some 55 miles from London, in the east of England. Whilst still a major regional railway station, the branches which once emanated across the country have long since been pruned. Among them, the line between Cambridge and the historic Suffolk market town of Mildenhall. Constructed between 1894 and 1895, the railway journeyed in a northeasterly direction for some 20 miles, running through a rural, sparsely populated landscape. Calling it eight stations and three halts, the line served both passenger and goods traffic. Regrettably, neither produced enough revenue to sustain this railway, which ran its last passenger service on the 16th of June, 1962. Combining archive footage and photographs, this film explores the rise, fall, and hopefully rediscovers what remains of this lost line. With the coat of arms of each college adorning its crown, the ornate facade of Cambridge Railway Station would greet passengers destined for Milden Hall. They would enter its famously long single platform and turn left for their train. For it was from platforms 5 and 6 that services to Milden Hall would originate. However, in this footage, thought to be taken in the mid to late 1950s, our train instead appears to depart from Platform 4. Proceeding north for one and three quarter miles, our train would reach its first station. Though named Barnwell Junction, here was not an interchange for passengers. The station served the Mildenhall branch alone. At the time this photograph was taken, only single-track entry was in operation as part of ongoing measures of economy. But this was not always the case, as can be seen here. Upon entering the branch, trains would be limited to a maximum speed of 30 miles per hour for the rest of the journey. Among the trees, we can still glimpse the ornate waiting room on the down platform and the truncated stretch of rail into the branch. Concealed from view, the station buildings are now a private residence and can be glimpsed by those travelling the Fenline to and from Ely. Our train departs, negotiating the 40 chain radius curve from which there was also a siding serving a local brewery. The same curve today, where the track bed is being converted into a major cycle route. But back in 2015, one could find the only surviving length of track belonging to the Mildenhall branch. In the years since the line's closure, it served a now defunct oil terminal. Under a mile from Barnwell Junction and two and a half miles from Cambridge, we reach the next station. Fenditton Halt was one of three such stations populating the Mildenhall branch, each of which opened in November 1922 in an attempt to lure passengers away from competing motor buses. Facilities were basic to say the least, with an oil lamp, cinder platform and running board at the foot of the slope, which led down from the adjacent bridge under which passengers would take shelter on inclement days. Today it is all gone. Fenditton and Holt's meagre construction would be the template for the remaining two halts which we will explore later on. On the outer margins of the city now, and the track bed is still to be found. The last architectural flourish of the Mildenhall branch as it leaves Cambridge, the bridge on High Ditch Road.
And here it is as viewed from the south. And on its north, the onward course. The railway is still visible as marked by the hedge and tree growth in the middle distance, though the alignment has long since been bisected by the A14. From its urban roots, our branch grows rural in character as we strike out into the countryside. Some two miles from Fendit and Holt, and four and a half miles from Cambridge, we reach Kwai. This remote station was located one mile from the centre of the village it served. Unique in its design on this branch, this timber-framed building once possessed a canopy and, hereabouts, a passing loop and signal box. The main structure still stands, having been restored after years of decay. The station master's house and crossing keeper's house are still to be found on the southern end of the site, but the signal box and other trappings of this neat rural station have long since gone. Venturing beyond the main building, we stand on the track bed and see that the platform is still to be found. Indeed, a bay platform used for loading agricultural produce such as sugar beet remains in place. And bolted firmly to the ground, a track chair, still fastened whilst so much else is gone. We depart Kwai and continue our northeasterly journey. After a short while, trains would pass a platform known as France's Siding. Concealed by tree growth, this was once a loading dock for the distribution of coprolite, a fossilised dinosaur faeces, which, when treated, made for a sought-after fertiliser. We passed the western perimeter of Anglesey Abbey, a country house built on the remains of a priory, which is now managed by the National Trust. Among the bracken, this railway fence post, with its tensioners still in place, stands over Bottisham Lode, where once a small iron bridge carried trains across its waters, and over which our train now passes. In so doing, passengers would arrive at Bottisham and Lode, some one and a half miles from Kwai and six miles from Cambridge. In its prime, the station was run by a station master, three clerks, two signalmen, a porter and an assistant porter, a not insubstantial staffing for so rural a station. Though occupied after closure, the buildings became somewhat worn down and the land overgrown. That is until recent times, where steps have been taken to revitalise the station site. We bid farewell, and so depart Bosham and Mode. Some six decades since it closed, all traces of the railway at this point have been concealed by the plough. Though this iron bridge over Swaffham Bulbeck Lode can still be found. Two miles since departing Bottisham and Lode, at eight miles from Cambridge, we arrive at Swaffham Prior. The station had a 360 foot long platform and the facilities one would come to expect of these civilised rural stations. And now the station building exists as a private residence and cannot be seen from the road. But in this footage, we are afforded a fine view of what once was. Whilst there appears to be little by way of passenger traffic on this occasion, 
the platform at Swaffham Prior briefly hosted at least one illustrious visitor. For on the 13th of June 1942, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth alighted the royal train at Swaffham Prior to visit land reclaimed for agriculture and the ongoing war effort. However, owing to wartime security measures, their presence here was not publicised and many residents of the village found out only after the event. Three quarters of a mile later, enshrouded in verdant undergrowth, the Reach Road Bridge saw trains pass beneath it on their northeasterly journey. A much clearer view of this delightful structure can be seen on its north side. Here, the wide formation of the track bed is evident. Only a little further on, the railway cut through the ancient defensive earthwork known as the Devil's Dyke. Victorian navies punched through it in order to facilitate the building of the railway. The camera does not do the scale of these earthworks justice but from the top one can obtain a fine view of the railway's alignment. Just under two miles since departing Swaffham Prior, we arrive at Burwell, ten miles by rail from Cambridge. With the exception of Quine, Burwell was similar in design to the other stations on the route, including its characteristic red brick construction. The station boasted beautifully presented gardens and was, by all accounts, the jewel in the railway's crown. Demolished in 1967, the station was subsequently overbuilt by a factory and, more recently, by housing. This plaque alone betrays the presence of the former railway. Passing beneath the now demolished bridge, trains struck out northeast once more. But today, the track bed has been utterly lost. Three quarters of a mile since departing Burwell, and ten and three quarter miles since departing Cambridge, the second of the branch's three halts came into view, Exning Road Halt. Nearer to Burwell than Exning, but still at a remove from both, the station was located in the shadow of Bridge 2241 and resembled Fenditton Halt in its economical design. The least used station on this line, those few passengers who boarded or alighted here would do so via a portable set of steps, or those of a retractable design on certain coach stock. Approximately the same view today. The bridge has been filled in and only a portion of fencing from the railway is barely perceptible among the verdant growth. On the bridge's north side, one of the few remaining traces of the structure can still be found. So our journey continues, and for some distance hence, the railway's embankment is marshalled by these original fence posts. Whilst this part of the railway north of Exning Road Halt may seem especially quiet, it was here that one of the most dramatic moments in the line's history was played out. On the 4th of December 1940, the 425 train from Cambridge was targeted by a roaming German plane. Dropping bombs which fell behind the train, the aircraft then strafed the imperiled locomotive with machine gun fire. Two passengers suffered bullet wounds and were taken to hospital upon arrival at Fordham. Leaving this extraordinary incident behind, we continue our journey. The railway passed through this field, marked only by this island of tree growth. In fact, this was the bottom of Stevenson's siding, a spur which led to the Burwell cement works. In this picture, we see the siding diverge from the line to the left. Access was obtained via a ground frame operated out of this hut. The view today is altogether different. However, if we venture in among the trees, the foundations of the ground frame can still be found. Along with other relics of the line, including fence posts, and this hook, which was likely used to hold the gate across the spur open. We travel up the siding, which is obviously marked out by the trees. and it leads us to the former engine shed which served the cement works, where today, and for some time, it houses a classic bus 
which once belonged to the Guernsey Railway Company. To the rear of the shed, rails from the spur are stacked askew. Like the siding which served it, this sizeable structure is now long gone, leaving behind little else beyond the now flooded mile pit. We return to the Mildenhall branch at the foot of Stevenson siding, and so continue our journey. Two and three quarter miles from Exiting Road Halt, and thirteen and a half miles from Cambridge, we reach Fordham. A junction station, Fordham boasted substantial facilities for the handling of goods. Its design differed from other stations on the branch, since it was originally built for the Ely and Newmarket line, which it also served. The main station building survives and can be seen at a distance. However, photographs supplied to this channel can afford one a closer look. Fordham was, in fact, the terminus of the branch for some months, while the extension to Mildenhall was completed. Like other stations we have seen, Fordham was at a distance from the community it was meant to serve, which was undoubtedly one reason why it ultimately closed in September 1966. Today, the curve east away from Fordham is marked by this hedge growth. The line between Fordham and Mildenhall was built by a different engineer to the one who oversaw the construction of the Cambridge to Fordham line, which is one reason why we tend to see more bridges than level crossings in the miles ahead. Three miles since Fordham, and 16 and three quarter miles from Cambridge, was once the station serving Islam. Identical in design to Burwell, the station was located approximately a mile from the centre of the village from which it took its name approximately the same view today. The station house is in private ownership and obscured from view from the bridge. So once again it is up to this delightful footage to give us an impression of what once was. We cross into Suffolk, and hidden from view by extensive tree, hedge and undergrowth, the bridge at four cross ways seems known only to those seeking to flight at waste beneath this delightful arch. Closing in on the penultimate station. We find the track bed located in this shallow cutting. And in so doing, 19 and 3 quarter miles since Cambridge and 3 miles since Iceland, we reach Wellington Golf Links Halt. Like Fenditton and Exning Road before it, Wellington Golf Links Halt was opened by the Great Eastern Railway in 1922. Indeed, as the name of the halt suggests, here was a station looking to capitalise on the lure of the adjacent course. The same view today. The bridge was demolished after closure, and there is little to signify the halt's presence. We approach the final station now, and, as has become custom, we note the overgrown state of the track bed. But it was here, after 20 and 3 quarter miles, that trains reached the end of the line, and the station at Mildenhall. Featuring a station master's house alongside the usual assortment of station facilities, there was once a signal box and a turntable. We return to the archive footage once more and the arrival at Milton Hall Station. The station today is a private residence, but it is surely evident that it once served another purpose. To the west of the station still stands the substantial goods shed. In 
In readiness for the return trip, the locomotive will be uncoupled from its carriages and run around the train. With great care, it would then make its way onto the turntable. Where, with not inconsiderable effort, the engine would be orientated in the direction of travel. Coupling up to the train once more, the driver would await the signal to depart. These scenes betray a lost way of life, and if nostalgia were a currency, the line may still be in use. But the numbers were not adding up. Operating at an unsustainable loss, British Rail closed the Mildenhall branch to passengers in 1962 and goods in 1964. Buildings, bridges, track beds and traces of the Cambridge to Mildenhall Railway may yet be found. But scenes such as these, the steadier pace, the quieter times, they are gone. Long gone. I hope you enjoyed this film. Please subscribe, like, share and follow Rediscovering Lost Railways.